Open your Bibles with me to Proverbs 10, verse 7, and John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Proverbs 10, verse 7. We'll just refer it to it, <clears throat> and we use it as a springboard to be able to preach the message for this morning. We get this principle first, and we use an example of a man that uh, lived out this wonderful proverb in Proverbs chapter 7. And beginning from verse 10, and then we'll turn to John 1. <clears throat> Notice what the Bible says there. The memory of the just is what? It's blessed. But the name of the wicked shall what? Rot. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we do come before you this morning and we thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this proverb. Father, your wisdom, Lord, that helps us understand the reality of our life and what we desire to leave behind. <clears throat> we ask and pray that you would work, uh, Lord, this sermon in our hearts. Help us be encouraged, Father, by men of God who loved you and followed you and had a heart to please you and do your will, leaving a good godly heritage behind, an impression, an example for us to follow and be encouraged. Father, I pray that we would be uh, focused, you'd help us, Lord, not be distracted by anything, the cares of life, stress that life brings. Rather, we would be, Lord, humbled before you, before your word, learning, having a heart that's prepared to help me convey your word to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> when we think about certain characters in the Bible, we think about the good examples that people have and the impact that they leave on our life, the uh, impression that they leave in our lives, the legacy that they've actually even left behind, recorded by the Holy Spirit of God. And, you know, this, many times we might look at these characters and we be, we're encouraged, but there are other characters in the Bible that discourage us. And uh, we look at them and we think about uh, the kind of name they have and the kind of name they've left behind. <clears throat> and so we see the two examples of good and evil, he, one that is just, one that is wicked, and the two endings, if you will, the result of those people that lived up to uh, their character. I want to start by saying, is what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? This is perhaps one of the questions I'd like to ask. Well, let me rephrase it like this. Uh, what do you want to be known for when you leave? <clears throat> Think about that for a moment. What, what, really, what do you want to be known for? When people remember your name, what do you want them to remember about you? What, do you? what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Because we know, we understand that the world leaves, uh, 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 you know, some people in the world leave kind of legacy that they follow, like Elvis and, and all these different people that they follow, this worldly character. But uh, what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind for your sphere of influence to your children? What do you want your children to remember you by? What kind of person were you? I asked Nikita on the way here, I said, Nikita, what do you want to be known for? He goes, that he walked with God. That's a good thing. Or that my uh, children saw that my father really loves the Lord. He really cared about the things of God. He really feared God. Or you can be known for a nominal Christian, a Christian that just, you know, Christian by name, doesn't live out what they say or whatever. You can be known as a hypocrite. You can be known for someone that just, have, you know, uh, lived both worlds in this world. It really had nothing to uh, follow after or pattern after. As a matter of fact, the only thing that they could see is what they see out there in the world. You left no impression in their life. Is that what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind or you want to leave something? 
that would encourage your heart to continue to look to God. Because really, we want to be in examples, and it's what kind of examples we want to be. We can be a good example or a bad example. And the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. As I look to Christ, you look to Christ. As I follow Christ, you follow Christ. I want you to walk as I walk, and my walk is following after him. Sometimes we name our children different names, not only because it sounds nice, but because of the definition of their name. We like the meaning behind it. Or sometimes we like the character of the Bible and we may name them after the character of that person because they had a good character. Who here would ever name their son Lucifer? Anybody? No. As a matter of fact, you, you'd be de de just you know, abhorred by the fact that someone even dared to because it had a wicked connotation behind it. And so you look at a name and you think to yourself, okay, uh, we, we named our... Uh, son Titus, not because of the definition. Some say that his definition meant nurse, others or nursing, or some say meant honour. But we named him because he had a he was a Gentile that had a, a, a heart for the ministry of the Lord. You could see that very clearly about how Paul spoke about him. He was submissive to the ministry. He followed Paul. He was under him. He was a, a, a laborer in the word. And so we, we chose Titus, because, not because of his name. As a matter of fact, his name would have been after the Roman em, uh, the emperor at that time, Titus. Uh, and he was a Gentile. Uh, perhaps had a wicked connotation back then, but then he used it for a good thing, Titus. <clears throat> a man that submitted under the ministry, a man that was there on the forefront with Timothy, and so we named Timotheus the same thing. Uh, Timo, Temo, to honour, Theos God, to honour God, not because of his uh, uh, you know, character, but because of his name, and let me say his character, he had a godly character. But more so for his name, we hope that he lives up to his name. Temotheos, to honour God. We hope that he will honour God with his life, and so, some people, listen, you may not have a name that exhibits a definition that is godly, Titus, not really, but his character was... <clears throat> and so what kind of name do you want to leave behind when people uh, speak your name and, and they hear your name? What do you want your name to be identified with? That's the question. And so when we think about these characters we, in the Bible, we think about good examples, bad examples. But there's one character that stands out for me, that has always stood out for me, and his name is John the Baptist. Go to John chapter 1. He left a good godly legacy, a testimony behind, that we'll look at today. Uh, John is typically known as John the Baptist. He was a man of God who loved uh, uh, the Lord, but yet was hated in his current culture. And as we look into his life, just briefly, we'll see that uh, not many liked his manner of life or his message. Most of all, they didn't really like the master that he followed. And so John the Baptist was hated by all sorts, religious groups, liberals, his government of the day. However, he was a faithful man of God who finished well and had a burning desire to do the will of God. This morning I'd like to uh, notice seven things, in his, uh, several things at least, three. The purpose, the preaching, and the persecution of John. Let's look at the first here in verse 29 of John chapter 1. And how he left this godly legacy behind, the purpose of John, his mission and ministry, uh, would be that he was a forerunner of Christ, who would pave the way or prepare the way for Christ. That was his main Ministry was to point people to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So John will be, no doubt, a chosen vessel by God used to prepare and pave the way for Christ. It was like a signpost, if you will, that presented the rock of ages. He, here it is, behold, the Lamb of of God. In Matthew 3.3 3, he says, For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, uh, saying the voice of one that crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so John the Baptist would be uh, the one that would highly promote the coming ministry or uh, the coming Messiah and uh, again was like a signpost pointing people to Jesus Christ. 
part of John's calling was to uphold the very person of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. He did what Moses did. He did what the uh, prophets did. He did what the scriptures did all the way through the Old Testament is to point them to Jesus Christ. Jesus said it himself, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They, they do what? Testify of me. <clears throat> and so John the Baptist would be called to testify of Christ, point him to Jesus Christ. He would be that signpost, that voice. He would have a ministry that was exclusively preparing the way for Jesus Christ. The significant uh, sin bearer. And Jesus said himself, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. And so he would uphold this Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God. And the purpose uh, to point them to Christ was to point them to their sin bearer, the one that could take their sin away. And, uh, and he would make disciples, not to follow just John, but disciples that followed John, that they would follow Christ. The whole purpose of making disciples is that they would follow Jesus Christ. Have a look at John 1, look at verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, that's the disciples of John, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed John. Is that what it says? No, they followed Jesus. And see, John was okay with that. Because that was the purpose of his ministry. John wasn't making disciples to follow John. Although he had disciples, John was making disciples to follow Jesus. And so all that John desired is to make disciples that will look and to Jesus, follow Jesus. Same thing with the Apostle Paul. The whole point of Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ, was, was the very thing that he would be an example. As I follow Christ, you follow Christ. And by the way, that's the ministry of the local church. That's, that's our mandate. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you alone with you always, even unto the end of the uh, age or in the world. Amen. So John, John didn't come to promote himself. John came to promote Christ. As a matter of fact, the famous statement that John said that would sum up his whole heart is found in John chapter 3, verse 30. He says, he must increase and I must what? Decrease. He must increase and I must what? Decrease. So in other words, John is simply saying that uh, I must get out of the picture now. Uh, I'm the one that was a voice in the wilderness preparing either way and making disciples that they will follow Christ. I must get out of the way and now Christ is coming. And that's what a disciple does. Initially, he's the one that uh, points them to Christ, disciples them and teaches them. But hopefully, we get to the point where we get out of the way and they follow Christ for themselves. Here he is. You know, there was a woman at the well that did a similar thing. She was testifying about the Christ that told her all things. She said, come and see a man that told me all things. And they came. And the Bible records the fact that they didn't only now believe on him because she told, she told him to come, but they believed on him because they heard his words. And what a beautiful thing that is, us being an example, pointing people to Jesus and being a testament in that area. But then when they come, they believe Jesus and they follow Jesus. And that's what we hope people to do. We don't want people, uh, if people are ever seek a following, well, you, know, you go out in the world, you go out on YouTube, you see a lot of people have man-made ministries promoting themselves. They're not promoting Christ. A lot of ministries today promote themselves. We had a lot of ministries promoting, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the industry, if you will, of casting out devils. All you hear is devils, 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 devils. You know, you rarely hear Christ and the preaching of the gospel and Christ crucified and all the rest of it. You know, other ministries, election, 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 election. Other men, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, power, anointing, 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 anointing. What about Christ? I'm not saying some of these things are good in their place, but, you know, uh, if Christ is not elevated and Christ is not in the picture and Christ is somewhere there in the background, you have nothing because the Holy Spirit's ministry was to come also and testify about Christ. It was to lift up Christ, not a man-made ministry, not this deliverance ministry, not promoting devils and demons. That's what we hear today. I think it's another spirit, another gospel, another Jesus, not the Jesus of the Bible. You know, the, the Apostle Paul said, I, I don't want to know anything among you but Christ crucified. He cared about Christ. God forbid that I should glory be saved or accept in the, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist did a phenomenal job 
of, of promoting Christ and getting out of the way and let people follow him. I think that's what we're lacking today. John exclusively made disciples who will follow Christ. William MacDonald said the entire job of John's ministry is summarized in this verse. He labored ceaselessly to point men and women to the Lord and to make them realize his true worth. He must increase. He must be lifted up. He must be followed. You know, John's, John's ministry was only temporary. We have a temporary ministry to, and, 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 and the life that we have to point people to Jesus Christ. We ought to tell people about Jesus. We ought to point people to Jesus. And John acknowledges the origin of the deity of Christ. He says in John chapter 3, verse 31, He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. See, John acknowledged the deity of Christ. That he had come from heaven. He, he preceded Bethlehem. He was and always is and always will be. He acknowledged the deity of Christ. And again, how many people, cults, religions, speak in the name of Jesus and even uh, you know, uh, Muslims and other people of that nature, Jehovah's Witnesses, undermine the deity of Christ. That he was a created being. And, or he was like just an angel. Just like Lucifer. You know, some of the Mormons believe that. John didn't believe that. He's from heaven. His origin is eternal. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and all in between. He's not from the earth. As a matter of fact, he was born by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we call him, the Son of God. And so John knew the origin of Christ. He knew the deity of Christ. John's joy was found in seeing people follow Christ. Look at verse, uh, John chapter 3, verse 28. Look what he says here. He says, ye yourselves bear, wit uh, bear me witness. In other words, he says, you can testify of me. You know and understand my, you know, my life, my ministry, that I said I'm not the Christ. I don't want you to be mistaken here. I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Christ. But that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. In other words, he's saying that Jesus is the bridegroom. You are his bride. Uh, there's an intimate relationship here between you and him. I'm not the bridegroom. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, uh, look at this, and rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy therefore, is what? Fulfilled. You know where jo John got his rejoicing and satisfaction and joy? When he seed people come to Christ and establish a relationship that was intimate and they loved the Lord. What a joy of John's heart. And what a, what a wonderful privilege it is to be a friend of the bridegroom to point people, hey, listen, I'm not the Christ, he's the Christ. It's him that you want to go to. It's amazing how many people follow men around the world to look at a show pony doing a, a miracle so-called in Jesus, and they follow a man. They don't eventually follow Christ. That's how you know when they're constantly following a man, following a man, following a man, all the way through. They're, they're not, they're not, the man's not getting in the way. Why? Uh, it's part of the man's, you know, it's not part of the man's, you know, uh, responsibility. It's sometimes the person. That's all they, they follow man. And they're so fickle. They go from one man to another man, and you can have even a man that points people to Christ and they still follow a man. But John made it clear that I'm not the Christ. And there's one that is the bridegroom and he points to him. And that's where he found his joy. John's great joy and rejoicing was found in seeing believers come and be married, if you will, so to speak, to Christ. He uses the picture of marriage to portray an intimate relationship that they should have with Jesus Christ. Brethren, if we are to leave any kind of godly legacy behind, listen, we must point people to Jesus Christ. We must speak of him. We must tell them about him and him alone and about how he can satisfy their needs and how he can save them and how he can forgive them and how he loved them. We must lift up Jesus 
Because lifting up Jesus is the very thing that will draw all men under him, whether it's good or bad. Our message is Christ crucified. Our message is Jesus is Lord. We preach not ourselves, Paul said, but Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Second of all, the reason John left the godly Herod's uh, legacy was because of his preaching, not only his uh, purpose. Look at verse 29 again of John 1. John's preaching had to do with his message, not only the way he preached, but the content of his preaching. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, look at this, which taketh away the sin of the world. There you have it. Yeah. This is the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. His preaching would have been, look, listen, Jesus died for sin. He would have preached the gospel. He's going to go in, uh, on the cross. He's going to die for sinners. And you can't separate repentance from sin. You, can, you, you cannot. If he died for sin, what, what are you going to change your heart and mind about? What are you going to be broken about? Sin. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What are they repenting from? You know why John was hated by some for his message? Because he, he preached repentance. You know why the, the prophets were stoned? Because he pre, they preached repentance. Uh, you mark it out, you mark out, because when you preach repentance, you've got to mark out sin. That's what normally takes place. You know, God, by the way, is the one that appointed the prophets of old to go back and tell Israel that they had sinned against God, they had turned to idols, and they needed to repent and turn their back on the idolatry, a spiritual idolatry, on adultery, and come back to the Lord. That's the whole point of repentance, is to come back to the Lord. Ezekiel 14, 6 says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus say the Lord. He's saying, Hey, Ezekiel, go, go and tell them, Thus say the Lord. Say to the house of Israel, Thus say the Lord. Repent and turn yourselves, he says, from your idols and turn away uh, your faces from all what? What, are, what is it? Abomination. <laughs> Prophets preach. Repent. That's what. Repentance was associated with sinners that committed sin and had to turn away their, their backs on their wicked ways. And no matter what form or fashion it was. The apostles preached the message of repentance. Peter said, repent and be baptized. Paul preached, he says, uh, in, uh, to, to King Agrippa, his whole manner of preaching. He said, I showed for, uh, first unto them of Damascus, and then I, in Jerusalem, and through all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for the repentance. It's all through the scriptures. The message that we preach about the gospel. As a matter of fact, preaching repentance prepares the way to belief on Christ. That's what it does. Well, that's what it should do. It prepares their heart. And that's what John was doing, was preparing their heart to, to, to believe on, on Christ, to have this disposition that was broken, to show them their sin and, and how they've turned from God to, to, to their abominations. Jesus preached the message of repentance. As a matter of fact, this was one of his first public ministry in his preaching. Not only the Sermon on the Mount, he hit the scene in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. After that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look at this. Repent ye and believe the what? The gospel. They had similar messages. No message has changed. It's always been the same. The, the only thing that has happened is that Jesus now has hit the scene. The, 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 you know, the gospel is made manifest and will continue to, uh, in, in the time of Christ, be developed where he will die, and buried, and rose again. The ministry of the preaching of the gospel is a threefold component. Number one is to win souls. We don't want to lose souls when we're actually preaching repentance. We, we want to win souls. We want people to come back to Christ. Mark 1 verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, for the forgiveness of sins. And, they, and there went out <clears throat> unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their what? Their sins. What a beautiful thing that is. When someone is broken, they come and they're broken and they're confessing their sin. It's a beautiful thing. 
You know, John's ministry was a successful one, not because the crowds flocked to him, not because he was this uh, you know, great preacher, not because he ate honey and locusts and people wanted to see, oh, look, look what he's eating. No. It, it was just uh, successful because he preached repentance. He preached what God told him to preach. He preached a genuine, authentic message. And he was faithful in preaching repentance. So people would get right with God and confess their sins. I think it's one of the beautiful sights someone can see is to get with someone getting right with God, someone humbling themselves. Man, it makes, it makes heaven rejoice, it makes God rejoice. It makes the, the believers rejoice. You know, when these young people getting baptized, you know, the common denominator was, you know, the, the reason was, especially young people, especially, and older people too, I'm embarrassed. Well, don't be ashamed of Christ. As a matter of fact, anyone that loves Christ will love you and it doesn't matter if you stumble in your words or even if you trip in the water, who cares? Who cares about it? We're glad that you're following Christ. That's my, that's my admonition. That's my admission to them. We're glad and we're happy. It's a beautiful thing to see people get right with God. Not to say that the water baptism saves them, but it's a declaration that they have in our day believed on Christ. You know, we don't have any more John the Baptist baptizing and preparing the way. Christ has come. And now we preach the gospel and they get baptized in the name of Christ. John was preparing the way for Christ. Understand, he was out of the picture. There's no more John the Baptist. It was a, uh, he had finished. Uh, he had, com he had comp completed his mission. But now he's, he's winning souls within his mission to point them to Christ. And the ministry of preaching the gospel has also not only a winning ministry, but a warning ministry. I think one of the hardest things is to warn people about the coming judgment. As about, Paul did, Paul warned people in Acts chapter 20, verse 31. He says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Not everyone desires to come to Christ. Not everyone will desire to come to Christ. Especially nowadays. We're not going to see, uh, you know, like the day of Pentecost after Peter's preaching about 3,000 flock and, uh, and so forth. We're living in a day where people are not coming to church anymore. They're leaving churches. It's like the, we're living in the days of apostasy. This is the day that we're living in. But the message doesn't change. We don't cater for the people that are leaving churches so we can make it a nice atmosphere for them to be comfortable, especially in their sin. We want to preach the gospel. We want to preach repentance. We want to warn people from the wrath of God to come so what they flee from it, so they'll turn to God, they get right with God. Matthew chapter 3, verse 6, and, and uh, were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine, you know, baptizing and all of a sudden seeing the re religious crowd, crowd coming your way, you know, with their long, you know, just, poof. yeah, back then they were affiliated with the authorities, so you could say that some, they, some, of, some of the religious mob had their own guards, their own security, not just the, uh, the security of Herod, but the security of even the chief priests, and they had like, you know, security and soldiers with them. So imagine these crowd coming up to John the Baptist while he was doing the work of God. And by the way, the mainstream churches today are working with the government. When we were in the COVID and they were locking down churches, there were some religious organizations and mainstream churches that were happy to work with the government. Hand in hand. That's what's going to happen in the future, by the way. And it will continue to happen. And those little, you know, churches around the world, that remnant that haven't bowed the knee, will be persecuted. But anyway, John the Baptist is there and he approaches them and he warns them and he calls them snakes. You, you're a generation of snakes, you are. Whoa. I mean, that's it's heavy, heavy, isn't it? A generation of vipers. Look at this. Who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So part of the ministry of John the Baptist, he left a legacy behind because he was warning people, not only winning people. He would win people and then he would warn people. That's not easy. Winning people is great. Warning people is hard. 
It's not easy to, to, to front up to somebody that is trying to mislead God's people and turn them the other way or downplay the gospel, downplay the truth and, and, and warn them uh, you know, in, a, in a sharp rebuke and even calling them as snakes. He says, bring forth therefore fruit meet for repentance. He's even telling them that they can repent. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham, and now also the axe, look at this, the axe is laid under the root of the trees, therefore every tree which bringeth, forth, uh, bringeth not forth good fruit is what? Is hewn down and cast into where? The fire. Wow. That's heavy. That's a warning. We warn people. If you don't turn, you don't repent, you're not genuine, you don't seek after your God with all your heart, uh, uh, you know what? Uh, you, you bear no fruit, you're good for nothing, that tree is to only be cut down and thrown to the fire. And the day of judgment will come one day. And this is what the whole purpose of warning them about the wrath of God to come. When you've got tares and you've got wheat, and they grow up together. And, uh, and Jesus says, let them alone. Why? For that great judgment day when, when, when the angels of the Lord will, will get the tares and throw them where? Cast them where? In the fire. It's a warning for all those that reject Christ. It's a warning for all those that do not want to repent and come to Christ. And Jesus also had a warning ministry. John testified about it in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with, a, with water and repentance, unto repentance, sorry. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and, look at this, with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, that he will burn up the what? Chaff with unquenchable what? Here it is again. You know, John the Baptist is simply stating the fact that when Jesus returns, he's going to execute judgment on all them that didn't repent and know not God and obey not the gospel. And then we have a witnessing ministry. Not only a winning, warning witness, but we're, we're witnesses. We, we may not win some, but we're uh, being witnesses to some. And that witnesses is being willing to lay down our life for others, giving our life, spending our life telling people about the Lord. When uh, Jesus gave the disciples the Great Commission, he says, Ye shall be my witnesses. That word witnesses in the Greek is martes. Billing, billing, it's where we get the uh, English word martyr. Being your witness even unto death. You're willing to lay down your life like Jesus did. You're my witnesses, where, where Jesus, even, even though people don't listen to us, whether they reject the message or accept it, we're witnesses, we're martyrs for Christ, so to speak. Uh, uh, Paul said it to the Romans. Uh, he said, it, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. We're dead to self by telling people about the Lord and giving our lives by telling people about the Lord. That's been a witness. It's not easy, again, to be a witness. Why? Because you have to be so conscious everywhere you go. Being willing to pass out a track, walking past letterboxes, up, uh, walking past cars, putting their in their handles. I think it's illegal now to put it on their windscreen because just in case it, it distracts them from... But, you know... Just anywhere and everywhere that you can think of, being a witness in, in, in the sphere of responsibility. You, know, you may not be an apostle, and you may not be John the Baptist, but you can sure be a witness. Giving your life, no matter where you go, being so conscious. Ready to give out a track, tell people about the Lord. It is every Christian's responsibility. But it's not easy. It's not easy, especially when you get in the conversation and now you have to tell them about their sin because that's where it needs to go. A lot of people don't like to be exposed or spoken about their sin. A lot of people don't like the fact that you're actually saying you're calling them a rebel, but you're not, you're not, rebe you're not rebelling against me. You've rebelled against God. We've all rebelled against God. What happened to Stephen? When he was rebuking uh, those that rebelled against God and resisted the Holy Spirit, he actually called them stiff necks. 
And sometimes when you're winning people, warning people, and you're witnessing, you have to call it for what it is. And sometimes it is the most difficult thing in being a witness, but it's a proper witness. You're not a false witness. You're a good witness. And every single person uh, must be dealt with differently depending who they are and what they're going through uh, and, and their upbringing, whether they're religious or lost or in their sin or whatever it is. But when, when Stephen marked out their, their rebellion and their sin and he called them stiff-necked, that's when all hell broke loose. He said this to them in Acts 7 verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised where? Where? In heart. Why? Because they were religious. They looked religious. They walked the walk, talked the talk. Uh, they did everything perhaps the law uh, uh, you know, presented them to do. But in their heart, they were uncircumcised. They weren't genuine. And is, he says, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. In verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Look at this. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. Can you imagine that? They stop their ears. I don't want to hear it anymore. You tell me, was, was, was Stephen a good witness or a bad witness? Some say he was a bad witness, lost his life. He couldn't, he couldn't spend it to Je for Jesus you know, all these years. He, he lost it prematurely. No, he died in the will of God. You know how? He ended up seeing the Son of, son of God, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He saw heavens open. I don't know about you, but what a privilege that would have been. Now, we're not, we're not Stephen, we're not Philip, we're not Paul, we're not John, but we're a witness. And we can be a, a witness in, our, uh, in the way that God has called us to be. What happened to John the Baptist when he actually marked out sin? You know why John died? You know why he lost his head? He literally lost his head, and he lost it in a very shameful way. Oh, what kind of legacy is that? Is that the kind of legacy that you want to leave for your children, Charlie? Like, do you want your head on a platter? Like, literally, it was on a platter, a silver platter. I mean, uh, she had the opportunity to have half of the kingdom of the king. You just, she had a wish. What, what do you wish for, my dear? You, you can even, a part of your list, you can have the half of the kingdom. Talking about bitterness uh, tell, him, tell him you want John's head yeah on a platter you think Herod wanted to go through it but he had to keep his vow even, even the heathens knew and understood what vows meant that day breaking a vow was a reflection on your character I don't believe that Herod wanted to do it you know why later we'll see it Herod feed John. He knew he was a man of God. But he was keeping to his promise. But imagine that. Imagine having half the kingdom. You don't want half the kingdom. You want the head of John. That's heavy. But he lost his head because he marked out Herod's sin. Herod, it's not lawful to have your brother's wife. Can you imagine that? Saying that to people? Saying that to the official... Uh, ruler of the government, hey, Herod. I mean, who would even speak like that? I mean, come on. Well, it, 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 it's right and proper. He was a prophet. He, his authority came from God. And that was, lost his head for it. Which we come to the persecution of John. In Luke chapter 3, verse 18, and many other things in his exaltation preached unto he, unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch being, re look, what's that word there? What is it? Reproved by him. For Herodias, his brother's wife, uh, Philip's wife, for all the evil which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he'd, sh he'd, he'd shut up John in prison. He's telling us something that future, future things will take place. And so John the Baptist ended up losing his head for standing for Christ, for pointing out sin, for being a witness and warning people. And we, you know what? We, we, it's what's going to happen to anyone that's going to leave a legacy behind. You're going to lose family. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose finances. You're going to lose even your own life. 
You're, gonna, you're definitely going to lose your reputation. Not likely you had one anyway, but you're going to, you know, what kind of reputation do we have in the world? It's lousy. But you're going to lose that image, if you will. They're going to look at you with a critical eye. You're going to think there's something weird about you. They're going to call you all sorts of names. Bible basher, Jesus freak, look at him. They're gonna, hey, listen, you stand uh, as a witness for Christ, win people to the Lord, warn others. You are going to be persecuted. You can mark it down. Paul even said it to Timothy. He was so timid. And it's not, listen, it's not something to glory in. It's something that the man of God wrestles with. Because you tell me, who wants to be persecuted? Naturally, the man wants to be loved, honored, respected. Who wants to be persecuted, spoken about, acute? No. Look at this, 2 Timothy 1, uh, verse 8. He says, be thou, uh, he says, be not thou therefore, look at this, he's saying to Timothy, ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Don't be ashamed of it. Nor of me, he's what? Prisoner. But be thou partaker of the affliction of the what? The gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. He says, you know what, Timothy? Don't be ashamed of the Lord and don't be ashamed of me because, you know, preaching the gospel, uh, winning people, warning people, being a witness for Christ brings shame. It brings shame. Oh, what a shame. What a shame for that church that got fined $38,000 because they continued during the lockdown. What a shame. Look at those rebels. Look at those people that are defiant. What a shame. That's no, not a shame. By the way, $38,000, if you ever lose that, we didn't lose it. We, we, we fought it. We took it to the court. And even the second judge saw the hypocrisy. And I thank God that God moved the judge's heart or he, he had some sense to realize the hypocrisy. But listen, even if we lost 38, what's 38,000 compared to the precious blood of Christ? He's worthy, my friend. But you know what? John lost his head. He lost his head. Not $38,000, he lost his head, my brother. That was his persecution. Paul saying to Timothy, don't be afraid, don't be ashamed of the Lord because you walking, uh, f uh, living a godly life and walking uh, in, in fellowship with God, preaching his word will bring shame. But you know what? The disciples found it, they counted it worthy that they were suffering, suffering shame for his name's sake. I count it an honor and a privilege. 2 Timothy 3 verse 10, but he says to Timothy this, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, look at this, purpose. And I believe he had the same purpose as John the Baptist, to point people to Christ. And he did it well. You look at the life of Paul, he did it well to point people to Christ. Faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Look at this, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch. Look how many places. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. What a troublemaker, Paul. Everywhere you go, you cause trouble. You're a troublemaker. No, he was winning people to the Lord and the evil people out there don't like it. They come, put a stop to it. Why? Seeing people get right with God? Oh, you're, you're losing a following now, are you? Look at this. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus maybe suffer persecution. Does it say that? Shall. In one form or fashion. One form or fashion. You know, John the Baptist was a holy man of God. We had God's hand upon him and he had holy boldness filled by the Spirit of God since his birth. But let me, let me say this to you. He left a legacy behind that we can look at and say, uh, hey, he was willing to lose his head. Now, he didn't know he was going to lose his head. I don't know, uh, you know, if you told me how I was going to die, he told Peter, Peter you know, how he was going to die. Oh, what about him? Oh, I'll just leave him alone. You know, what's it to you? You go do what I've called you to do. 
So we don't know how we're going to die, if we're going to die a martyr or not, but listen, living for Christ is leaving a legacy behind that our children will live for Christ. Don't worry about the outcome. Let God take care of that. But you know what kind of legacy he left behind and, 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 and the impression that he made to King Herod? You know, when Herod hears about Jesus coming into the scene and he hears what's taking place and he hears his disciples preaching, you know what he thought? He thought John the Baptist was risen from the dead. Now, I don't know about you, but what an absolute compliment. You have mistaken Jesus for John the Baptist? Why? Because of his uh, miracles? No, 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 no. We'll get there in a moment. John didn't do one miracle. Not one. But because of his preaching and the content of his preaching. It's recorded that John the Baptist didn't do one miracle because of his boldness that came from, not arrogance, his boldness that came from God. I want you to see it. The purpose of John the Baptist was the same as Jesus. Jesus gave him that purpose. Preaching was the same. Marking out sin was the same. The manner of life that he had, he was following after God's uh, 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 son in, in his manner of ministry. I want you to see it in Mark 6. We'll go through this slowly. Have a look at Mark 6, please. It's amazing how holy men of God that have the Holy Ghost in their life leading them and they dare to stand in a society that's trying to shut down churches or gag the mouth of the preacher. How, how they're misunderstood. Spurgeon said, bold-hearted men are always called mean-spirited by cowards. And it's so true. Look at verse 7. I want, I want to go through this slowly. And he called unto them, the twelve, that's Jesus, and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only no script no bread no money in their purse but he shod but but be shod with sandals and uh, not put on two coats and he said unto them in what place soever ye enter in in the house there abide till ye depart from that place and whatsoever shall not uh, whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart then, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should what? Repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil, many that were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. Therefore mighty works did show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or uh, uh, one of the prophets. Now, why? Because uh, Elias or uh, uh, Elijah, uh, the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them. Thus say the Lord, repent. Micaiah to King Ahab, I'm not going to say anything as long as I live, but accept what the Lord tells me to say. Oh, I hate him. Yeah. That, 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 this is the kind of legacy you want to leave behind. This is what you want people to know you for. That they spoke the word of God, they lived the word of God, and they didn't compromise. Our society wants us to compromise. The push to compromise is so powerful out there, I'm telling you now. But they didn't compromise. I want you to continue to see and read here and understand verse 16. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He's risen from the dead. It's got to be John. For Herod himself had sent forth 
and laid upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now let me say something to you. Is, that, is, there, is there anything wrong with that? Is there anything wrong with saying that? Oh, it's not right. It's not lawful. It's against the law. It's wrong. Fornication is wrong. Drunkenness is wrong. Idolatry and adultery is wrong. It's wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. You dare to say that, even if you're a public figure in public. You'll be losing your job. You'll be, you know, if you're, if you're a prominent person on the news outlet and you dare to speak like that, you're finished. A lot of people are com com compromised. You know what they're saying? Uh, homosexuality can be practiced at home, but don't bring it to our children. No, it's wrong. At home, in the world, anywhere, it's wrong. People that are on the far right are compromising. People in churches are compromising. Love is love. It's okay. No, it's wrong. It's wrong. Who said it's wrong? Now, you know how many times people asked me last night, where do you, what do you think about when we're out in vivid soul winning? What do you think about homosexuality? They try to bait you. I said, I stand where God stands. And where's that? Oh, you know where he stands. You ought to be asking the question if you didn't know it was wrong. Where did the question come from? Because you know it's wrong. And I stand where God stands. But you know what? We're all sinners. And this is I go back to the gospel. I'm not trying to condemn, I'm trying to help them. I'm trying to win them to the Lord and let them see their sin so they can see their Savior. You know, we don't got to go and blow bullets at people and give them no hope. We want them to have hope. We want them to repent. We want them to turn. But listen, there's some people that don't want to turn and they don't want to come to God. They're the enemies of God. Listen, and they're the ones that cause you grief. But even when they do, even when they do. You can't kick and butt and compromise. You've got to call it for what it is and say, no, it's wrong. It's wrong. One day, preaching against sin is going to be outlawed. Especially the sin of homosexuality. And you do. You're going to, even behind the pulpit, now, we don't make it a point to go right there, but if you're going to preach through a book like the book of Romans, you're done in chapter 1. <laughs> you're done in chapter 1. You know, you don't make it a point to say, okay, it's outlawed now. And No, you do what you did a fourth time like Daniel, amen? You preach, and, but if you happen to go there, I'm not going to say now, I'm going to stay away from the book of Romans. You know why? I'll be put in prison straight away. You say, oh, is that the kind of legacy you want to leave behind, Charlie? You know, you go in prison, you've got eight kids and the wife neglected. Oh, come on, you're worse than an infidel. You can't provide for them. You know, during COVID, when I wanted to continue, I had men that were elders in the church saying, think about your children. You can't go to prison. Think about your children. And I had a wife laying in bed saying that God has prepared her heart for me to end up there. You know why they were known? The prophets were known. Jesus was known. John the Baptist were known. For that. Standing in the face of adversity and preaching even when a, a, a decree was made that was unlawful to make. Even Daniel, even Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We know them because of their stand. We know them because they love God and would not compromise. That's why we know them. We don't know them for their oratorical preaching and their ex they know how to exegesis. Get, please. Please. And you know what? The common, the common little boy can stand and the old lady can stand and, and they will be known for memorial of them because they love the Lord. They sacrificed. They broke an alabaster of box. You know, breaking an alabaster of box was, was expensive. You have to save up maybe one year's of wages. Can you imagine that now, uh, time right now? 85,000, one year wages gone, sacrificed the Lord, given it up. Just like that. And the religious person says, this could have been given to the poor. Oh, really, Judas? You really cared for the poor, you, you hypocrite. But they do that when they're intimidated by those that show extravagant love to God.
Well, in verse 18, John said that under Herod, it's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore, he, 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 Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod, what? What happened? Herod feared John. <laughs> so she couldn't coerce him like Delilah coerced Samson. She knew she couldn't because he feared God. He, oh, he feared John. Uh, but in fearing John was knowing that he was a prophet. I dare not touch this prophet. This is of God. All right, not only this, knowing that he was a what man? He was a what man? He was a just man. A just man. And uh, a holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Wow. You know, so Herod was there observing John and his preaching. And he had feared him because he knew he was a man of God, that he preached the word of God, and he was a holy man of God, and he was just because he marked out sin and he hated it, and he observed him. You could have seen that maybe Herod got convicted there for a moment. I'd say he would have. There's no doubt. He heard him gladly. It was his wife that was causing problems. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of, uh, or the, daughter of the uh, said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou will, and I will give it. And, sh and, and he swore unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto, look at this, look at this, half of my kingdom. Wow! Now, you probably think that the person that is sane will say, give me the half of your kingdom. She went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. See how wicked and evil this woman was? She was a Jezebel and a half. And she came straightway with haste unto the king and asked him, saying, I will that they give me by and by in charge, the charger, the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for the oath, his oath's sake and for their sake which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent execution, executioners and commanded his head to be brought and went and beheaded him in the prison. Here it is there. There you have it. The persecution of John. It's, it's not uncommon that persecution will come and be faced. You know what? People do it this way so they can threaten you and say, you dare to stand like John? You dare to stand like the prophets? You dare to stand like Jesus? We'll crucify you. It's a fee tactic to shut your mouth. Persecution has always been a fee tactic. Whether with words they threaten first and then they pursue the words that they threaten you with. You say, how do you know? Because not only the scripture outlays it, but I've gone through it. But brothers and sisters, life is not worth living if you can't live it for Jesus. Life is not worth living if you can't open your mouth for Christ. And you want to be intimidated by those people that hate the Lord and don't want to come to the Lord. No, I'm not intimidated by you. Because there's that one person over there that needs to hear it. Many of you have heard the gospel, believed and were saved. I'm a byproduct of the gospel. I thank God someone came and told me about the Lord Jesus. Because the motion of that miracle took place in my life the day I believed. It's a miracle. The greatest miracle that can ever be had is someone come to know Christ and be born again and Christ get a hold of them and change them and prepare them for heaven. That's the greatest miracle. You know what? That's the legacy I want to leave behind for my children. Because no one will ever get saved without the preaching of the gospel today. It's by the preaching of the gospel, the foolishness of preaching, 
that God will use as the method to save some. And you get rid of the preaching, my friend. And preaching, you know, it's not like teaching. You have some both, teaching and preaching. But preaching has something to do with reproving, rebuking, exhorting, with all long suffering and doctrine. Like I said, winning, beautiful. Rebuking or warning, hard. Reproving, hey, listen. Things go well when I'm talking to them about the love of Christ. But as soon as I say, look, listen, you're living in fornication. You might want to go and find separate houses. You get saved, you get saved and get married. I'll be happy to do that and then do it God's way. Oh, what's wrong? That's God's way. It's beautiful. And you know what? A person that genuinely comes to Christ and sees their sins and gets saved will want to do it his way. That's a no-brainer, that one. But we're living in a society that churches accommodate for fornication. They dare not to speak against that. They dare not do. You know, we live in a generation that people are siding with fornicators against the one that dares to mark it out. That's the day we're living in, brethren. Yep, that's the day we're living in. John the Baptist, as I said before, wasn't known for his miracles. He didn't do any. Look at this, John chapter 10, verse 41. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle. He did no miracle, but look at all things that John what? Spoke of this who? Man, Jesus. Well, there it is. This is how they knew John. Whatever John said about Jesus, that's what they gravitated to. Not about miracles. It wasn't about the signs and wonders. Wow! It wasn't about walking on water that they remembered him about. Or, and I'm sure Peter would, would, would agree. It's not about walking on the water. It's about coming to Jesus and, 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 and embracing him and preaching Christ and, and telling people about him. That's what matters. But you know what today? Signs and wonders and dreams and visions. and This person got cast out and they, oh, they're shaking like this. No, you know, they're not having demons cast out. They're actually giving them demons, I believe. Demons cast out happens like that less than maybe five or ten seconds in the word. Today they're wrestling with a demon. Get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out for 45 minutes. It's like all I see is a show pony promoting himself. John the Baptist was promoting Christ. He was uplifting him. They remembered what John said about Jesus was true because Jesus was manifesting not only his ministry. Yes, he did miracles, but the miracles were to authenticate his message. And the preaching. I want you to see in Acts chapter 4, and we'll close. Have a look in Acts chapter 4. Look at this. What were the apostles known for? What kind of impression did they leave behind? I want you to see it. Remember Peter pre-Pentecost. <laughs> do you remember Peter pre-Pentecost? What do you remember Peter pre-Pentecost? What do you remember about him? Here, what is it? Oh, you almost said it in unison. He denied the Lord pre-Pentecost. But when the Holy Spirit of God came and testified all things that Jesus spoke and recorded things to his memory, he preached with boldness. And I want you to see it here in Acts chapter 4 and look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deeds done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you, uh, unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at Nord of, the, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there any, uh, sorry, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus is the only way. There's no other name. No Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus or, uh, you know, Mary or Catholicism or anything of that nature. Only through the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, he's the only mediator between God and man. Listen, that's boldness when you say that. That's boldness when you say that to someone that upholds another religion. That's boldness when you say that with someone that living in sin. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Jesus is our sin bearer. He came as the Lamb of God. That's boldness when you preach Christ. 
And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with who? There it is. What a legacy to leave. Oh, that's the, it. They're the Christians. They're the Christians. That's what I want to be known for. I've been with Jesus, and I'm a Christian, and I love the Lord, and I preach Christ, I'm going to preach the truth to the day I die, accepted or not accepted, in season, out of season, where the people know I'm going to lift up his name, I'm going to preach his, uh, his promises that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he will build his church, and the way he'll build his church is by the preaching of the word, that he uses us to go forth, and that he works, and the Holy Spirit convicts, and we continue to do what God's called us to do, the, and, 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 and maintain if you will, the spirit of boldness and courage because that's what we need. When they were threatened, they told the church, the church prayed for more boldness because when you're threatened and your life is at risk, what tends to happen is you cower. We better not continue. We better not go. This will happen. They went back, told the church, church prayed, God gave them boldness, they continued to go forth. Didn't we tell you not to speak in the name of Jesus? Didn't we tell you not to speak in this name? Well, we cannot but speak. <laughs> you tell me, you tell me. We, shall we obey man or God? God or man? You tell me. Which is, which, is, which is, we must obey God rather than man. What a legacy to leave behind for these little ones. That my father, my mother obeyed God and put him first and loved him and stood even when she lost her life even when he went to prison, even when he lost his job, even when, you see, is that what you're preaching? You're preaching that we should lose things? Listen, John lost his head. But isn't the prosperity gospel is that you gain things, health and wealth and all the rest of it? Isn't that what you should be preaching? And then you'll get the crowds, Charlie. Don't you know that? No. I don't want to be known for that. I don't want to be known for a prosperity pre preacher that twisted the word of God to milk people for their money. I don't want to be known that someone that always speaks about money, although money's in the Bible and giving's in the Bible, I don't want to be known for someone that is, you know, oh, he prays and people, when I tell you, his prayers are heard and they're healed. No, God's the healer. I'm nothing. I don't want to even be known as a, a, a preacher that can preach or an evangelist that can soul. I want to be known that I lift up Christ and I pointed people to Christ and I didn't compromise and I was willing to lose my head for it because that way out is shameful. It may not be remembered in our society here, but it shall be remembered in heaven because the martyrs have a special kind of resurrection. Read Hebrews 11. But you've got to already be dead men walking. I'm willing, Lord, I'm done. My life is done. Not for your ambition. We're not here promoting, so we're here to promote Christ. And that's what God has called every single one of us to do in the form and fashion, uh, abilities and gifts that God and the measure of grace and faith that he's given you to promote him, him alone. And they look and say, hey, there's, something, there's something that resembles this person. He just looks like and talks like Jesus. He, up, he uplifts God's will. He does the will of God. He's not afraid. They've got boldness. They love the Lord. Paul, in his preaching, affirms the fact that John finished what God called him to do. Have a look. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John, look at this, fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. You know how John maintained his, his mission and ministry by fulfilling his purpose and preaching Christ and being persecuted for it? Here it is. He had a disposition of I am not worthy to even be a servant of Christ. But he has given me the privilege. And even the apostles counted it a privilege. I'm asking you today, do you count it a privilege?
to, na- to bear the name of Christ. And yes, the reproach of Christ, if necessary, before you go to be with Christ. Or you want to go and live like Judas, Demas, Elvis, all these rock stars and football players. Having their photo on the wall, signatures here. What, what legacy do you want to leave? You're not going to be popular here, I'll tell you that much. Not a lot, you know, everyone hated John the Baptist. You hear his name? Everyone hated Jesus. Hear, the majority of the world hates them. They'll, and they'll hate you. And I'm not going to say this lightly, but what a standing ovation Peter had. Uh, Stephen had. He stood. Wow. Not to say, but this, 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 it's just an honor, Lord. Not to say that God is honoring Stephen. He just, he embraced him in, and the spirit of glory rests upon him. It's not easy to go through that. There, there, there's, there's, there's some sort of, I can't explain it to you. But this is what will keep you going. And brethren, from, from here on, and I'll probably in the last several years preach messages like this. And they're not popular messages, but we need them for what's coming. I'm telling you, we need them for what's coming. And if it's not going to come in our lifetime, it, it, it will come in some form and fashion if we're gossiping the gospel and we tell people. And not a lot of people want to live this crucified life. They don't want the crucified life. They don't want to be crucified with Christ in this way and suffer. But it's not only given to you to believe, but to suffer for his name. You know, Paul said, I, want, I count all things but done to share in the power of the resurrection and, and share in his sufferings. People don't understand that. You know why? Because they don't understand this. I'm not worthy. They think they're worthy to be his servant. We're not worthy. We're just unprofitable servants that are privileged people to be what God has called us to be. I'm telling you now, our kids will have no hope. Listen, they'll have no hope whatsoever in their generation if we do not stand against evil and preach Christ crucified. They'll have no hope. Nothing. Because the legacy that people are living behind is what do you want to be known for? No, seriously, what do you want to be known for? What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Whether they appreciate it or not. You know what Nehemiah said? Let's fight for our children. Yeah. Let's fight for our children. And I still believe the promise of Jesus very clearly when he said, I will build my church and not the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I still believe that. I still believe that with all my heart. You say, but they overcame him. They overcame the saints. No, no, no. They overcame with, by the blood of the Lamb. Their martyrdom was glory, my friend. That's what the paradox they don't understand. They think they, think they won. No, brother. No, sister. We won. We're victory. We're victorious. We triumph, we triumph in, in Christ. No, dying for, living and dying for Christ? Brother, there's no greater honour to get here on earth than live and die for Christ. But you'll never be willing to die for Christ if you don't live for Christ. And you know why people are not willing to die for Christ? Because they're living for themselves. Remember last week's message? We weren't called to live for ourselves, were we? We were born to glorify God. May God help every one of us leave a legacy behind that these children here can see and follow and say, oh, I want to be like my dad. He loves the Lord. I want to be like my mum. She loves the Lord. They follow, and they're not compromising. They really love, they're not religious people. They love the Lord. You know why they love the Lord? Fuck it. Look how my father loves my mum. Look how he loves people. Look how he loves me. Because that also, my friend, is an attribute of a Christian that follows God. Don't you think just because John the Baptist was bold didn't, didn't mean he loved people. 
and he was this austere preacher that couldn't be moved. Or Jeremiah had a forehead like, you know, God gave. They were all men of God that loved people. They loved God and loved people. Misunderstood? Absolutely. Because they'll never compromise for those people that don't love God. May God help every single one of us to leave a legacy behind that we can say we love the Lord and we walk with God and we were bold in Christ and we didn't compromise. Amen? Let's pray.